So let's, um, let's begin this afternoon's session. And uh, in this case, something that is really in the context because of the place we are. And the theme is island and marine tourism. And to moderate precisely the uh, next session, I would call up to the stage Mr. Roy Ariel, the general manager of uh, GSTC. Mr. Roy, round of applause, please, for this gentleman <laughs> who has been, uh, you see him everywhere, don't you? And uh, as panelists, I would also call to the stage uh, Mrs. Marlene Damian, our Regional Director of Tourism, so the Regional Director of Tourism for the Azores. Mm -hmm. I would also like to call Mr. Jerry Spooner, Director of the Vanuatu Department of Tourism. Welcome up, sir. And Mrs. Rosa Harris, Director of Tourism of the Cayman Islands. Thank you very much. So, island and marine tourism. Enjoy it. Good afternoon, everyone. We already listened over the past day and a half to quite a few destination representatives here. And there are quite a lot of types of destinations that share many traits of management cha challenges. But there are, of course, some that share specific and a little bit different traits. In this session, we will focus on a few issues facing island and marine destinations, which can be quite sensitive. We'll have examples and insight from three GSTC destination members. First, we will hear from uh, Marlene Damiao, Azores Regional Director of Tourism, about the history of whale hunting and whale watching in the Azores. Jerry Spooner, Director of Tourism Vanuatu, will speak about Vanuatu Sustainable Tourism Policy, the VSTP, which currently prioritizes the well-being of the Ni Vanuatu and the protection of tourism assets. Rosa Harris will later on, um, Rosa Harris, the Director of Tourism of the Cayman Islands, will share the Natural Disaster Management and Preparation Scheme and the Core National Tourism Plan. Can we please have the PPT on? Thank you. Right. So first, let's have a quick look on the destinations what we are talking about. The Azores is over here in the middle of the Atlantic. We have the Cayman Islands from the Bahamas area, uh, sorry, from the Caribbean area, and we have Vanuatu in the South Pacific. Um, in this session, we will also touch upon some of these criteria of the GSTC destination criteria. You can have a look, I don't need to read them out loud. And I think that quite a few of you have participated in the training this, this week, so you have it fresh out of your mind. And if not, you can always check later. We will start with Marlene Damiao, Azos Regional Director of Tourism. She's, a co she's currently the responsible of the Regional Directorate of Tourism, the government department in charge of facilitating the sustainable development of the regional tourism under reliance of the Regional Secretariat for Energy, Environment and Tourism. Marlene is an expert in languages, lecturing German language courses at Bristol School Institute in Porta Delgada, and was invited to teach in other private schools. In 2003, she took a post-graduation in strategic management and tourism development. Between March 20, 2003 and May 2019, she was the academic director of the Azorian Tourism Hospitality Training School. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I truly hope 
that my voice doesn't interfere with the quality of my presentation. I'll try, I'll give my best, where I'll give my best. And please feel free to interrupt me whenever you feel like you're not getting the message. Well, as it was said by Roy, I'm going to be talking about whale hunting to whale watching. If my voice was okay, it would sound like a history that I was going to tell you. But nevertheless, I will do it the best I can. From the 17th century onwards, Western commercial whaling began expand to all oceans. Although in the Azores, the relationship with cetaceans might have started with settlement in the 15th century, as they are referenced from the Azorian historian Gaspar Fertuz, 15th and 16th centuries, that mansion uses the name has fats, bones, and dead whales washed ashore for the production of fuel and building material. It was with the presence of American whaling vessels in Azorian harbors, attracted by the resident populations of sperm whales and the convenience of a mid-ocean port for crew repairs, refueling and recruitment that truly triggered the entire sequence of events that led to the historical relation that our islands have with whaling. On aboard these American ships, Azorians learned the techniques and knowledge put into practice from 1864 onwards when coastal whaling in these islands started. The activity expanded and at its peak, which was at the end of the 1940s, early of the 1950s, there were 21 whaling stations in operation in this archipelago, all involved with the processing of the 23,500 and 57 sperm whales that were captured from 1896 to 1897. Gradually, global demand for whale oil and other products starts decreasing, which in a sense anticipated the need to think about a new paradigm. Do Tratado de Adesão, em 1985, decorreram oito anos de. Without sound, please. Thank you. In 1982, the International Whaling Commission put forward a moratorium with restrictions on commercial whaling though it was not fully implemented until 1986. Portugal, at that time, was not an IWC member, so the islands, for that reason, were not bound by that moratorium. Portugal complied with the directives the year it joined the European Economic Community, the EEC, and this, at that time, extended to the islands. In fact, whaling had already stopped in the Azores in 1984. Though, and that's a very interesting detail, the last whale killed was in 1987, when some old whalers from Pico Islands took to the sea in protest. However, the end of whaling in 1987 finds a new growing sector, tourism, and open the door to a new economic activity, the commercial observation of cetaceans, which began in the Azores in the early 90s. This activity, marked by a beginning of a new type of Azorian relationship with the cetaceans, through which these mammals were still a resource 
but at that time, more valuable a life than that. Rather than cutting back on the past, this new activity used infrastructure, people and expertise of one century of whale tradition. The old whaling factories became museums. Land lockouts once used to detect and guide whaling vessels were reactivated. In some cases, operated former whalers. And in addition to tangible heritage, intangible heritage is kept also alive through regattas using traditional whale boats. Soon, the Azores positioned themselves as one of the best places to spot cetaceans and whale watch to be a prosperous activity. This is a very important detail. Around 25 species of cetaceans can be observed in the Azores. This is two thirds of all species known in the world. This tourism activity developed really fast. And in less than a decade, the number of clients doing whale watching was around 15,000, and there were 28 licenses vessels. By 2004, that number doubled, 30,000. 30, In 2016, an estimation of 84,000 people went whale watching. Today, there are about 24 licenses companies, mostly of them concentrated in four of our islands. In total, they represent around 4 million just in ticket sales. Most whale watching companies are family based. Even without pointing exact figures of the overall value of this marine tourism industry in the Azores, it is clearly one of the most important tourist economic activity in some of our coastal communities. For example, Pico Island. An early perception of the growth of this activity led, in 1995, the local government, together with stakeholders, researchers and NGOs, to the process of drafting local whale watching guidelines and rules that would allow the industry to grow at a controlled pace, with an opportunity for adaptive regulation, which, by the way, at the moment, is being reviewed. Regulations were implemented in 1999, being successfully revised since then, and include guidelines on platforms, approach methods, duration of interaction, maximum number of boats allowed per group of animals, number of licenses authorized for a year and for islands, specifications on the maximum size of for the boats, scuba diving not being allowed with whales, and snorkeling is allowed but only with certain, dol certain dolphins. Together with these regulations, there has also been the implementation of a growing network of MPAs, marine protected areas, taking marine management beyond the traditional one-dimensional approach based only on the species to an ecosystem-focused approach. But, of course, we know that much more can be done. Whale watching is an alternative to whale hunting in Azores. 
and it has been a good example on how to offer value to a community through tourism. And the proof of that, when it is properly managed, is that it can induce conservation, research, cultural preservation, and economic growth, all, all of which fall within the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. To conclude, we all know that small islands have inherent characteristics that can border their development, but apparently marine wildlife tourism can combine different goals of progress and conservation. Today, whales are the standard bearers of our marine conservation, and whale watching has taken a leading role in promoting the development of sustainable tourism in the Azores. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marlene, especially with the, the losing voice. Appreciate it. Uh, next will be Ms. Rosa Harris, the director of the Cayman Islands Department of Tourism. Ms. Rosa Harris is the director of the Cayman Islands Department of Tourism with over 20 years of experience in the tourism and hospitality sector in the Cayman Islands. To help manage and shape the Cayman Islands tourism industry, Ms. Harris serves on multiple boards committees. She is the chairman of the Public Transportation Board, the Hotel Licensing Board, and the Cayman Islands Hospitality School Council. Ms. Harris also serves as a member on the board of the, for the National Flag Carrier Cayman Airways Limited, the Cayman Island Field Commission, and the Tourism Attractions Board, and the Cayman Islands Marketing Professionals Association. Earlier this year, in June, Rosa was the recipient of the Caribbean Tourism Organization, the Jerry Award. She was recognized for her leadership and passion in promoting travel and tourism for the Caribbean region. There you go, Rosa. Thank you very much, Roy. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm told that we're to have a casual conversation from the seat, so I forgive me for sitting, um, but we're welcoming questions at the end and want to have a robust conversation. So I will be pointed and share with you about our national disaster planning in the Cayman Islands. Uh, for many of you who are familiar with the Caribbean, we experience six months of hurricane season. That starts in June and it goes through to November. And it is also a seasonal time of the year where we see a slowdown in tourism arrivals. So being a traditional time of the year where we're trying to attract more business, um, where there is a fall off from our high season mid-April through May, um, we're also challenged with the fact that there are a number of storms that go through our region. And I'm sure you're aware of some of the uh, recent storms that have found their way across the Atlantic to almost Europe. So uh, when we think about climate change, uh, the size of storms, the length that they live, uh, it's a real um, risk to our industry for a very large portion of the year. In the Cayman Islands, we try to engage with, uh, from the tourism department, we engage with our partners about safety, security, and communication. Understanding what a hurricane watch, a hurricane <laughs> warning is, and having a proper evacuation process. 
Visitors to our islands are not encouraged to stay during a natural disaster. Uh, we try to evacuate all visitors that are on the island that are stay over. Uh, we have a national airline, Cayman Airways, uh, who's instrumental and used as a strategic tool to evacuate our visitors to the closest and safest point away from a hurricane. But it, it takes a number of agencies to do an evacuation, and I believe, Roy, you wanted me to focus on how we coordinate cross-agency, cross-government, along with our partners, because it, it takes quite a bit of coordination. The Cayman Islands has three islands. Most of you may be aware of Grand Cayman. It is the largest and most popular. But we also have two sister islands, one Cayman Brac and the other Little Cayman, and they're very small islands. Uh, Little Cayman has about 250 residents year round, and Cayman Brac has about 2,000 residents year round. And everybody else of the 70,000 persons that live in the Cayman Islands live on Grand Cayman. So when we're threatened with a storm, along with potentially 20,000 additional visitors that are staying over, it's quite the exercise to ensure that those living on the sister islands um, get to safety, whether that, depending on if the storm is affecting the sister islands or if it's affecting the big island of Grand Cayman, or if the entire um, island trio is under risk for a natural disaster that everyone has access to evacuation. Um, but particularly focusing on the visitor, where our mandate as the Department of Tourism rests, uh, we communicate with the Immigration Department, our Customs Border Control Agency, to, they register all visitors on the island so we know where they're staying and we get updated reports in an evacuation exercise as to how many persons have left and who remains. And that communication goes back and forth throughout an evacuation exercise. In addition to that, the Department of Tourism also communicates with partners. Have you spoken with your guests? Do you know what phase we're in? Do you know what phase we're in and how many hours does that mean? Is it 48 hours? Is it 24 hours? And what are you doing to secure your property to ensure that your asset can survive um, the potential risk of a natural disaster? So we spend June through November uh, watching the Weather Channel, understanding what's going on in the region, we also play a secondary role as a good neighbor and citizen of the Caribbean. So we're a, we're a British overseas territory and uh, we have um, BVI, Anguilla, Montserrat, Turks and Caicos. All of us have been affected in some way as British overseas territories in the last four years, um, some more severely than others. And we've also, as a government, uh, offered relief, again, through our national airline, whether it's taking a flight of supplies over, our nurses, our police officers, um, various resources sent to our brothers and sisters in other islands, not always British overseas territories. We have recently provided aid to the Bahamas. Uh, Bahamas suffered a very severe storm most recently. So top of mind is always being prepared. There's never a downtime. You're checking that you have the necessary measures in place that secures your physical product or you have the necessary um, assets in place for communication where that might be radios and other things and that there is ongoing relationship understanding. So. We have the most up-to-date contacts with our Customs Border Control. We know who is managing the property, if that person has changed. So natural disaster planning and management is at the core of our concern as we welcome visitors year-round, but particularly through the season of June through November. That goes a little bit into my next point of market development we try to build our slow season and shoulder months, which 
is right over hurricane season. So we talk with um, airlines uh, about visitation and new service. We try to expand and diversify the markets that we're in. At the moment, our primary source market, because of our location, is the United States. Uh, so we try to ensure that we have diversity in the markets and the times of year that they visit us. And our ultimate goal is to flatten seasonality. So the level of visitation that we see, which is tremendous December through mid-April, we would love to see that consistency throughout the June and November months. So we we're looking at various areas of Europe, Latin America to deepen um, our diversity of visitors, uh, and that includes um, the types of partners and, and business and trade partners that we speak to throughout the year. Touching on a little bit now of our national tourism plan, um, I met a number of you this week and we talked about certification in terms of what the Cayman Islands um, commitment is to certification. We did a GSTC assessment in 2016, and that gave us a very good understanding of where we were as a destination and what we needed to work on. From there, we felt it was necessary to create a master plan and understand what the priorities and uh, vision was for each island. Each island is extremely unique, um, and they're all very different. So our plan was finished this year and accepted by government. Uh, and we move into then, we're here to look at the various programs for certification of the various aspects of our industry. Um, and we're also looking at our legislation to update our regulations and laws to be able to broaden and also be relevant for present day in terms of managing our overall tourism product. So that in brief, if I believe I'm on time, is a synopsis of the Cayman Islands and how we manage our island, marine aspects, and seasonality of some of the challenges with natural disasters and market shifts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa. Uh, we will now have Jerry Spooner. Jerry Spooner is the Director of Tourism for Vanuatu. His professional and academic qualifications reflect his mix of financial and tourism interests. Under his leadership, the department has embarked on an ambitious program of building government tourism policy around the principles of economic viability, social acceptability, and environmental responsibility. In development of these policies, Jerry has had to negotiate the challenge of working with organizations that range from small indigenous businesses with limited understanding of business practices and international tourism to globally based NGOs and multinational corporations with substantial experience and influence. Jerry. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to sit down too. the Vanuatu Sustainable Tourism Policy. Prior to having this policy, um, for the past uh, years since independence, I'd say, 1980, we have been operating in a, a uh, not proactive, but uh, reactive mode, meaning any interest that would come up uh, from investors or government thinks, uh, believes the priority uh, area for us to focus on, we'd go with that. The challenge we've seen with that is, we all know, we exhaust all our available resources, minimum resources that we have, and at the end of the day, we do not achieve anything. The timing of uh, uh, developing this policy uh, was good because we're starting to see the growth in the uh, tourism industry and with the help of the New Zealand government, uh, we've asked for a proper thorough consultation to be, to be done and to ensure whatever policy we come up with is a living, living document and not another document that ends up uh, on the shelf. So 
When developing this policy, we highlight too um, the need for a focus on the concept of sustainable tourism. And noting that Vanuatu has uh, over, three, over 83 islands, uh, we have six, six provinces. Um, we t it took us over a year, say a year, two to three months, for us to come up with the policy that we, we have now. And the consultation that took, uh, was involved, uh, involved communities in all six provinces, meaning children, children's household, uh, farmers, uh, teachers, uh, community leaders, chiefs, uh, the area secretaries or local government uh, uh, council was involved in the development of this uh, policy. And it gave them that sense of uh, involvement, uh, ownership of this, uh, of this document. Um, we have about, uh, we have um, five goals within the policy, uh, 32 objectives, and over 50 uh, actions that we are now starting to implement within every of our aspects of work. The focus of the policy itself uh, is more on on human, it being human-centered. Uh, reason being, we have realized the, uh, the movement, uh, the movement towards uh, <laughs> locals, uh, particularly uh, the local residents, uh, not retaliating, but are starting to uh, go through social platforms, media, to, to question government, why, why is this, why has now uh, why has this become the priority of uh, government in terms of uh, tourism development? So, in the whole process of developing this policy, we note the importance of uh, community engagement. We, we got them involved. And we, as part of the implementation of the policy itself, um, we note too that from past till recent, uh, our focus has been on visitor expectation. Uh, hence, our visitor survey that we've been carrying out for the past uh, three to four years, and the business uh, uh, business uh, index survey index. So, from next year on, we are working uh, uh, in partnership and support uh, from the New Zealand government to uh, to follow on from what the Cook Islands and uh, New Way uh, are doing, and that is the uh, community survey that they are carrying out. So, we want communities to to be involved too in in the, how we decide how the tourism sector should be managed, the development of the sector. So we want them to, to be involved. Traditional economy I mentioned here. Uh, traditional economy, when we started the journey towards um, uh, formalizing businesses, uh, we have our um, uh, sector sector um, standards that we've uh, developed. Uh, we have rolled out for over five years now, but we've come to realize that the effort itself too is to try and get um, business to formalize, uh, particularly lo local operators, to formalize their business. And that is, we've noted too, uh, a despair that it has uh, created. It breaks down this community, working together as a community, it uh, it uh, it destroys the the uh, working together as a household family. You're getting families to argue uh, over land, uh, over the beach, when one sees the other um, uh, running a formalized uh, business, getting tourists, and there's uh, money involved. There's 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 issues with, uh, that we've we've come to note, and that is why with this policy we we are trying to. To, to find ways to, to maintain, to keep that traditional economy. So when talking about the traditional economy, we have here um, recognizing the principles of, uh, sorry, the traditional knowledge. So we, we've come to, to realize that um, uh, food security, housing, widespread employment, social security, locals find in having 
their own uh, land, uh, land that they do not lease, but they are entitled to uh, through as customary land. And in the process too of this uh, implementing this policy, we would we are trying to. Uh, it, it is a challenge, but what government is trying to do too, in partnership with other government agencies, is to protect what we call our key assets, being the, the society, the people, the environment, uh, the culture. And this is what, from the surveys that we've been carrying out, uh, we've noted from visitors, the reason why they've come to Vanuatu, it's not because of our beautiful beach, because our core market being Australia, they have more than enough beautiful beaches. Uh, but it is our people, very friendly people, uh, the culture that still exists, and the natural environment that, that is there. So, so, we've just had a had our, uh, Sustainable Islands uh, Conference uh, last week, and as, as, a, as a sector that a lot of, uh, a lot of us look to as the sector who, who's contributed towards uh, the damaging of the environment through uh, uh, um, reef, uh, damaging of the reef, the coral, and cutting down of mangroves to, to build resorts. And so having this policy in place, we, we are trying to to show in that uh, we are not just uh, uh, talking about or showing that we have a policy, but we're actually implementing it. In our conference itself, it's all about showing, showcasing local cuisine that we, we have using local chefs that we've uh, gone to training programs and uh, having it, um, having the setup at the uh, local traditional meeting house that we have. So you would notice from a lot of this uh, um, participants that you, you see some attending the conference walking barefoot with no jandals on. And during the conference to a positive outcome from that, as you can see, uh, we've got the Director of Tourism from the Cook Islands and the Director of Tourism Palau and myself uh, establishing a, uh, a commitment, a statement of intent we call so we want to partner together to work towards uh, sustainable tourism. So the three countries have made it a criteria for every other member countries to commit to uh, having a sustainable tourism policy. And we are now working with the South Pacific Tourism Organization to work towards having a, a clearer Pacific wide regional framework for sustainable tourism that we'd all like to work towards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. Well, I would like to ask a few questions to each one of you. Uh, let me start with Marlene. After seeing these um, and some questions that came um, from the audience that I've been speaking with in the past two days. I'd like to show these figures. These are the number of the, the number of the size of the destinations that we are talking about, their population, the number of day visitors, which mostly refers to cruises, and those that actually stay for an overnight that come through flights and etc. Quite a few have uh, raised the concern and questions related to overcrowding the amount of visitors compared to the amount of the residents. And Marlene, I would like to address a question um, as now the Azores become more, more popular and assuming that tourism continues to flow and increases every year, is there actually overcrowding or is it dispersed? Maybe you can elaborate on it. Oh, but now it works. So, Roy, that's actually a very interesting question. If we consider the fact that yesterday, and I have to say, 
without any humbleness. We were certified as the first archipelago sustainable in the world. So, of course, we know that uh, Azor's notoriety is increasing. We are aware of that. We are also aware that the search for <coughs> active contact with nature is being a growing demand. But as Luigi said yesterday when he was speaking to the media, we are not overcrowded and at the moment we are not at risk of an eventual over-tourism that might threaten our tourism identity. And to explain that a little bit better, I would like to give you some notes. For example, there are some measures that we as the Zorian government have been taking in the past years to assure that we will handle in a proper way the tourism and the increasing of it in our communities and in our islands. The growth of tourism recorded between 2015 and 2018, about 66%. In addition to that growth, of course, there was also a growth in the accommodation. Most of the accommodation I'm talking about is hotels. Many of them were closed, were completely abandoned, and the trade starts to recover those hotels. But there are some plans, strategical plans, that we have that are our mentor and our guidelines in the way we handle tourism. And I'm sorry I have to look at the paper, but the translation of these are a little bit wider. The strategic and marketing plan of the Azores tourism. This is a very important plan for us. With this plan, what we basically do is we favor the small and medium size units. We want these medium-sized units and small ones to have a very high quality standard related and bonded to our culture and local traditions. And we mainly want them to obey green international standards. Our priority is to give the Azorian a concept of coziness, but at the same time, cool. That's the ideal we want to visitors to have from our destination. This strategic also defines that we want to promote units with breakfast included, but we want lunch and dinners to take place in our local restaurants. We want our economy also to grow side by side with the growing of also an industry that is called tourism. If you allow me two more minutes, there are also two other plans that we have, and I also have to read those. There are our territorial management instruments, the regional land management plan, and the Azores Autonomous Region Tourism Man Management Plan. These two plans are very restrictive in what concerns to the permission of building large <coughs> sorry, accommodation units. What we basically do is our incentive system is designed in order to not promote the construction of big resorts, all included concepts, but the small differential products that we want to keep as being part of our world heritage. I'm now going to stop. It's better. I have some more things to say, but I'll leave it to next. Sorry. Thank you, and I'll 
I think I will wait with the next question so your thought gets a little bit better. And I would like to share one, one personal experience of what you say. Um, I arrived a few days earlier, as you might assume, um, and I stayed at the Tercera Mar Hotel, and I realized that some of the, some of the guests, they, um, they were going just across the street. They, I saw them having lunch and dinners um, at the hotel sometimes, but then I saw them crossing the street and getting a pizza from the local pizza truck where they had to be with everyone. So I think it's, it's seen, it's very much seen. Um, Jerry, a question that I preferred for, prepared for you is about this beautiful photo that I've seen that our director, uh, Dr. Mihi Kang, the director for Asia Pacific, she attended the conference uh, for the sustainable island tourism that Jerry mentioned. And I love this photo that she shared on her Facebook. I see no plastic here. And I remember that I was reading about a very strict ban on plastic, uh, single-use plast si single plastic. But I was wondering, um, how, how do guests, when they come, and, and, and I assume that, I don't think that anyone needs a reason on, on why this ban has been taken, um, has been put, but do visitors, when they come, is, is there any challenge? Do they need to adapt? Do they need to change any of their behaviors? Is, is there anything from that side, or it's all smooth? Thank you. Um, there were a bit of a challenge from the start, but we we had to we had to do that. Um, so the challenge was from the repeat visitors, I'd say, from the start. But now that we are uh, we've started with our responsible visitor campaign, we are we are working with the airlines, and um, good news too, the crews are coming on board. So. We've got this uh, responsible visitor campaign that we're airing out in, uh, we having uh, go out uh, this month with the, our airlines. So before visitors arrive, or when they arrive in Vanuatu, not just a video they get to watch on the in-flight, uh, but we've got posters, uh, good uh, awareness posters to, to let them know that these are the, this is what and what you should be doing, how you should, you should be conducting yourself while here. Uh, before, till recent, we've, we've had locals uh, that are not happy with how uh, visitors conduct themselves, the way they dress, the way they interact with uh, the communities. But I think we've realized it's an opportunity to uh, be fair and educate them before they get to, to the destination that this is how we would prefer you conduct yourself, and these are the things you need to consider, and we've built on this uh, plastic ban into that too. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask you another question. So, to my understanding, there are more than 80, how many, more than 80 islands, how many exactly? 83. 83 be, islands in Vanuatu. In the Azores, we have nine, and uh, the Cayman Islands, we're talking about three. Having 80 islands, that's, that might be a little bit of challenge in the question of dispersion of, of uh, tourists, but to, to, I know that there are different attractions in different islands, but how do you manage from that perspective? Because this is also one of the, one of the issues that the, 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 the policy is talking about, trying to to disperse the, the benefit, uh, the distribute it more evenly between the islands. Maybe you can speak more about that. Thank you, that's a good question. Before having the Vanuatu Sustainable Tourism Policy, the, direct, the direction, the common um, uh, directive for interest was for every of the islands in Vanuatu to be involved in tourism. After having this policy, I think it's, it has come to uh, more clarity in that tourism is not meant for, for all the islands. So they can participate uh, to address your question, but through value addition linkages, so islands that can uh, focus on farming, 
supplying to the mainlands, the islands that are involved with tourism, uh, handicrafts. You've got islands that uh, are good. They're known for good quality handicrafts that could be sold to tourists, but not necessarily need tourism to be uh, to be there for tourism activity uh, activities, uh, particularly resource. Um, in terms of carrying capacity, I think it's it's good that we keep it that that way, and so they can still can involve. But I think it's more value addition linkages to I mean supplying to uh, sub -destin sub destination within Vanuatu that are uh, uh, involved with tourism eh? directly through having accommodation tours and activities. So yes. Thank you, Jerry. Um, when I was reading about the Caymans, preparing for this panel, the Cayman Islands, um, I came across this brochure that shows the clear guideline for the hurricane season. Um, and I was wondering to myself, because it's not the only place that we have around the world that is prone to na na natural disasters, especially now, with the climate crisis that is a little bit more talked about and, and agreed upon and we can see that cyclones and other tropical storms are affecting each other. Do you have other, other island states that came to you to learn, to see what you're doing, perhaps copied from the tourism perspectives? Hopefully this one works. Great. Uh, thank you for the question, Roy. Um, we have our hurricane season guide. Uh, this is really a guide that circulated to all partners, the image that you see on the screen and some of the emergency contact numbers and, and tips. Um, that's just one tool that we use on island. But as I mentioned before, in hurricane season, it, it also affects business. So if we're threatened with a hurricane and we go through an evacuation period, that means those visitors have an interrupted holiday. Uh, the time that they intended to spend with us in the Cayman Islands, they did not get to see it fully um, as they intended. So we have a worry-free guarantee program um, that's only valid for the hurricane season, those that visit us June through November. Our partners participate and underwrite the program and we promote it. And the program includes that if you're on holiday during hurricane season and your holiday is interrupted, our partner will commit to honoring the days that you have lost for another time that's most convenient to you. So that's how we safeguard the business and one, having a loyalty program uh, to ensure that guests can fulfill their dream vacation that they have very much saved for and look forward to with their families. But also, I like to think about it as deposits in the bank. We've deposited something in their bank that says, we value you as a client. Uh, we realize that some things are beyond our control, but we want you to come back and see us and finish that holiday that you so deserve and you work so hard for. We have had a number of hurricanes since 2017 that have been extremely severe and violent. Cayman Islands hasn't been affected by that, but our neighbors have. And when we started to promote our word free guarantee program in 2018, following two major storms in 2017, Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria, we were approached by our colleagues in the industry, in the Caribbean region in the industry, to say, can you show us what the details of that program is? The government doesn't pay anything other than promoting it, ensuring it's on our website, ensuring that our trade partners understand what we are offering, and our partners underwrite it because they then say, I will ensure that I guarantee a room for you at your convenience at another time because you were impacted by hurricane season. And we've seen other islands adopt the same program. It, it's one of those measures that we believe for client retention, you spend 
so much time, so much effort, understanding your strategy, investing in marketing dollars, um, investing in your tourism product, and to lose a client because of fear of a natural disaster um, isn't fair. So that's the program that we've offered to our clients. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. All right. I think this is a time that quite a few of you have been waiting for. Some questions from the crowd. Can we change it to Slido, please? Okay. So the first question is addressed to Rosa. Well, it's not the first, but that's the one that achieved um, the most upvotes. Rosa, why are the Cayman Islands considering building a giant new cruise ship terminal, which is opposed by many locals, if it wants to be more sustainable? Thank you for the question. The Cayman Islands government has spent the last six years um, conducting various studies and environmental assessments to improve the visitor experience. So currently at our cruise terminal in Georgetown, uh, we tender all of our guests. And if you saw our visitor levels um, that Roy shared earlier, this year we'll welcome 1.9 million cruise visitors. Cruise has been around for a long time in the Cayman Islands. It's more established than stay over. Uh, so yes, uh, the people of the Cayman Islands also have initiated a referendum to vote if the cruise berthing facility that is proposed actually goes ahead. Uh, it is um, a topic of conversation that's very active in the Cayman Islands, and now it's gone into a legal process of judicial review. So the island has a huge commitment to the environment. There's a lot of um, discussion around what the impact is on the project. Uh, but the government feels that in order to stabilize the cruise tourism industry and grow stayover, that building piers was the best way forward. But now it's in the hands of the people because they have, they have initiated a referendum to vote if it goes forward or not. Let's take this question, which would probably be... Does anyone have any answer for that? Um, do you have uh, some examples of lower emissions and lower impact technology for boats used for marine tourism activities? Okay, we'll skip that. We don't have currently a good and um, a very interesting example to share. Um, Marlene, this would be for you. What actions does it exist to punish bad professionalism in whale watching? <coughs> well, thank you for the question. It's actually a very interesting question. I mentioned a few details on my PPT presentation, but this is a very important issue for us. Um, actually, we are reviewing the legislation related to the whale watching, and um, because every island has its own specificity, we try to assure that most of the details that affect the whales are um, assured. For example, we, like I said, we define approach methods. We also limit the license numbers of companies that work in each island. Depending on the size of the island, we limit the number of licenses. Actually, São Miguel Island, which is the biggest island in the archipelago, already achieved its limit. They are not allowed, we don't allow any more license for whale watching. Another thing is the size of the boats. Our legislation says that the boats are only allowed to have 20 meters size maximum. 
So we believe that the capacity of each boat and its size is something that we should pay attention to. We don't want massive tourism in our waters. We want to preserve our animals and also assure that the experience that our tourists will have while doing whale watching will be memorable. Another thing is also the <coughs> maximum number of boats that are allowed to go at the same time to the ocean. Actually, none of the boats, none of the, boat, the companies are allowed to go more than twice a day. So that's the maximum they can go, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. So I believe that uh, when I said, when I gave you all these indications, I partly answered to the question. But there is one information I would like to add. But this information, I have to apologize, it's very technical, so I will have also to look at the paper, which is, we are preparing in the near future some measures concerning our marine protected areas. For example, I can tell you that the Azores archipelago right now has a bit more than 5% of the protected marine territory. That is about 50,000 square kilometers versus one million square kilometers. Our intention is, in the next three years, <clears throat> the regional government intends to enlarge the marine protected areas <clears throat> up to 15% of its exclusive economic zone. The definition of these new marine areas is supported of course, by scientific studies that are already in progress. Our goal is to obtain its total protection. That is 150,000 square kilometers of protected area. Just to let you know and have an idea, that is about one and a half times the area of the entire Portuguese, the mainland. I'm oh, sorry. I don't know if I answered the question. Thank you. Oops. Just a moment. I accidentally deleted the question that. Yes, that's a question for Jerry. What can global tourism learn from Pacific traditional values in becoming more sustainable or regenerative? What can global tourism learn from Pacific traditional values in becoming more sustainable? That takes me back to a point I wanted to make earlier, but uh, <coughs> kept looking at the time. Eh? So, uh, a lot of the, when talking about sustainable tourism and regenerative tourism, we have noted from past till recent, you'd have academics, you'd have consultants come in to Vanuatu and learn from how the locals, islanders, manage themselves and live as a community and come up with some new terms, terminologies. But this, these, are, these are our ways of living for centuries. So if anything for, for, for us to, to learn from the Pacific traditional values in becoming more sustainable or regenerative, that is to the focus shouldn't be on money. It should be about being, being happy, uh, inclusive, getting everyone involved in the process. And in, in that, I think uh, tourism can really be sustainable because I note uh, when I started this role as a 
director of tourism, there is pressure, and I, I make reference to a few presentations early on today, and that there's always pressure on making money, increasing visitor arrivals. But if if that is if that is our focus, then we've gone we've gone so wrong. And when looking at uh, traditional uh, Pacific traditional values and way of living, it's it's always about community, looking after your community, looking after your family, immediate family. I've had challenges uh, as director. I need to I I have to remind myself a lot of times when you've come to note that a lot of the my staff, my team members, work work is not their value, it's not their number one priority, it's family. Thank you very much. Uh, let's take this question that quite a few voted up. Um, let me answer that. I think that the answer is actually quite simple. It's not different from any other destination. Uh, in that sense, although island tourism is, is different in many senses, um, I don't think from the numbers that we've seen, none of them exceeds the number of tourists that arrive in New York, San Francisco, Paris, um, Lisbon, and you name it. And people also fly into there. So the aviation part is not necessarily just for the islands. Uh, in that sense, I think that we can just refer to it as a general one. And that's an issue that we all have been discussing with, but I, don't, I really don't believe that it's part specifically for the island destinations that we have discussed so far. Continuing about climate issues, would anyone like to answer that, given the current crime, climate crisis? What does the future of island tourism look like in the next 10 years? Any prediction? <laughs> And it's been edited, it says to me here. I wonder what was the edit. Would anyone like to take that? Well, I'll take a risk. But anyway, I cannot add much information to this question in a direct sense. What I can share is that <coughs> the Zorian government recently published a regional program for climate change. And what we did was this, this program is basically an instrument for planning, reinforce the knowledge, and to contribute to the climate change mitigation. So I would say that our plan probably is assuring that the next 10 years are in our perspective and in Azores, uh, we're safe, I would say. The strategic goals of this plan and program are protect our goods, resources, and people. So showing that we already had that in mind and that we have been preparing that track, I think it says a lot. It says that we are also concerned the climate change and we want to be prepared for them thank you and i think that another thing is that this is what we've all heard about um, the azores being certified receiving the the silver um, certification from earth check as a sustainable destinations the policies and the uh, programs and 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 um, strategies that are being developed in and being used in both in Vanuatu and the Cayman Islands. Um, these are exactly things that we do, these three destinations, and I think all of us here that are here in this crowd are here to know how we can do it, and this is what we do. Um, Time-wise, I think we are just in time to... We have more time? Okay. So... This is the end for this session. I see that you have still more questions. Um, the three. I want to say one more thing. Yes, last, one last thing. So just, I want to add one detail for each of the questions, the first two, that one you made and other the others. Adding an information to the measures that we are taking about 
marine resources and our protected areas. One very important detail, our job won't be enough if other countries and other territories don't follow our example. It's, it won't be worth our work protecting some areas if others don't come along because many of the ocean territories are shared. So this is a challenge that we uh, make to other uh, countries that are also concerned about marine resources. The other detail I want to add to your first question is, um, according to the sustainability measures, one of the things that we do is we implement limits to the carrion capacity in areas of more tourist traffic. So I think that says a lot about over-tourism and overcrowding. We have many protected areas in our uh, region that only allowed, for example, one allows 400 people a day, the other allows 100. So that also means that we want to monitorize the frequency and the amount of people that visit our places. Finally, I would like to say that the two biggest challenges that we believe that we have as a sustainable destination are seasonality and complementarity, because we are nine islands and we all want them to grow in the same level. They're all different, of course, but this is something that we really think it's one of our main points. And finally, saying the words of my Secretary of Tourism, it's something that we use as our mission to define ourselves as a sustainable destination. Tourism is only good for, <coughs> sorry, tourism is only good if it's good for the Azorians. So as long as the Azorians are happy with tourism, it's okay. When they start being unhappy, we have to start readjusting and rethinking our way of thinking. Thank you. That also definitely resonates with what um, Jerry commented before. Uh, Rosa, would you like to make any comment? Or? Can you hear me? <laughs> Perfect. I wanted to follow on um, Marlene's comment about uh, marine protection. One aspect, because you asked me to talk about disaster management today, one aspect that's very much celebrated in the Cayman Islands is our 30 plus years of marine parks and replenishment zones. So we have distinct seasons for lobster season, conch season, and there are areas um, around the islands that are not um, available for fishing. Um, so for us, in terms of how we deal with environmental issues, we've had a long history of um, maritime as well as um, our people using the marine environment as a resource for work and also for sustenance. I'm here today uh, to share that for us, it's a balance. We know that our people participate in cruise tourism and they also participate in overnight tourism. And for the comment about what will climate change be, what will it look like for island tourism in 10 years, from my perspective, it's about celebrating what means most to your island, um, the authentic aspects of it, and what you'd like to communicate and what you'd like to leave with the guests that visit your island. But again, it's about how you go about it and how you manage it. We have a very well established cruise industry and we're trying to grow our overnight industry to be just the same for balance. And we realize that there are three islands that can benefit from that, not just one. So just to ensure that I convey that the Cayman Islands is very much um, in tune with that there's a lot more work to do, a lot more thought behind sustainable tourism, and it's, it's not done overnight, but it takes considerable 
thought, and work. So thank you for the opportunity. I would like uh, to thank everyone that was on stage. Uh, and for those that haven't had their, answer, uh, their questions answered, we're still here. Daniel, I can answer you at the break. Uh, Anonymous, you can also ask Marlene at the break. And thank you again so much. So uh, we'll be back from uh, break at 4 o'clock, okay? 4 o'clock and we join in. <laughs>